Hello, I'm Pastor Bill Vigue of Meet of the Word Ministries, and you are watching Let Us Go On. Today, I want to talk to you about the story of Job, and we're going to look at uh, this particular book and his story a couple weeks now, just to present some things, because I believe it's very important that we understand this book. So many Christians today have been suffering because and have not been able to overcome because they think that they're a Job situation. And we're going to look at some of the fine details. Most people that study the book of Job or have read anything about the book of the Job, they know, uh, they know the first two chapters where God allowed Satan to attack Job. And then secondly, they know the last chapter where God blessed them in double and, and everything. But there are so much detail in this particular book, 42 chapters of this book of conversations that we need to delve in. And I'm going to highlight some of the major features here. Now, years ago, in regards to this book, I wrote a book called Help, I'm Suffering, Why? And again, this deals with the subject of Job. If you write in, call in, give us some information, we'll send that out to you free of charge. But I believe it's imperative that Christians become better acquainted with this story because it'll help them become overcomers and not defeated or deceived by the devil. Unfortunately, a shallow understanding or a misunderstanding of the book of Job has left many people in their affliction, in their sickness, in their disease, and have not been able to overcome and get there because they think that God is doing it to them. And so we need to look at a closer a detail of that. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That 42 chapter book has a lot of words in it, a lot of things that are in there. Not only that, the Bible says that all scripture has been given by inspiration of God and is for this purpose. It is profitable, which means it's helpful, it's serviceable, it's advantageous, as well as for doctrine, for reproof or conviction, proof and evidence, examining the word, and also the scriptures are given for correction to straighten us up, literally is what the, uh, the Greek word means, and for instruction or training and education so that the man of God may be thoroughly uh, perfect in his righteousness. Now, there are two things I want to highlight here first off. Number one, Job was the greatest man in, in his generation. There's only one reference in the Old Testament that refers to Job other than the book of Job itself. And in it, it's uh, the prophet Ezekiel, and he was speaking about the judgment that was coming on the children of Israel in his, in his day. And he said that if Noah, Daniel, or Job were in the land, their righteousness would not save the nation. So God, the word of God and the prophet of God knows that Job was is the greatest man in his generation and equal to Noah and Daniel. I mean, it, God highlights this man. And so I, I, in no way do I want to demean him. And the things I'm going to bring out here, you know, and we're going to see some of the flaws, some of the shortcomings, some of the faults in, in man. Uh, the book opens up by magnifying him as the greatest man in his generation. And so we don't want to speak down about Job. Job was a man of God, a man of faith, but he was never illustrated in the scriptures by anyone else, in anyone other than you know his, his righteousness and his greatness great character, but his faith was never illustrated by anyone. Jesus never spoke of Job, especially not of his faith. Paul, James, no writer of the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, ever spoke of Job's great faith. There's only one other reference in the scripture, uh, in, in the New Testament, and that's re referring to um, James, where he says this, uh, behold, we are, we're grateful for those who endure. You've heard of Job and how God was pitiful and mercy on merciful on him so i want you to you know be open because we don't want to venerate job either just like you know in some religions we some people venerate the virgin mary think she's the one the mediator a lot of people have done the same thing with job that he was so great no my friends he was a man he was a mortal man and the bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of god and in these 42 chapters god highlights some of the shortcomings of job even though he was the greatest man of his generation he was still a man and he was not without fault and we need to understand that there's only one man that is totally perfect and never sinned 
And that, of course, was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He was tempted in every way, but he never sinned. He could have sinned because he had been made a man and he stripped himself of all his God, God qualities so he could show us how we can overcome and we can become sinless. And one day we are going to be sinless after the fullness of the redemption has taken place. But until then, we are as mortal as Job was. And one of the examples or lessons in the book of Job is that even some of the, even the greatest of men are capable of floundering and falling, giving in to despair and depression and speaking without knowledge and even saying things against God. Now, initially in the book of Job, Job sinned not. He did not sin with his mouth. He did not sin with his tongue. He did not do, do anything wrong. We're going to look at, well, let's, let's take a look at this in the book of Job here. Chapter 1. Again, the first thing I want you to see here is that um, in the first two chapters, we see that Job did not sin. He maintained his integrity before all men. And there are, you know, uh, several points that I want to make, make mention here. First point is the initial greatness of Job and his character and his faith in God. The very first verse says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now, the King James says he's perfect, but again, nobody is perfect except the Lord Jesus Christ. That word translated in the Hebrew would better, better serve as being complete, to be sincere, to be morally and ethically pure. Job was that, again, the greatest man in his generation. He was a sincere and upright and moral man. Secondly, he was an upright man. That means he was correct in his behavior, in most areas of his life anyways, until you know he finally broke, and he was well-pleasing to God. And then it says he feared God. That's a reference to the reverential fear of God. And then fourth, he eschewed evil. The word eschewed here means he turned from evil or he avoided evil. That's a remarkable thing that we all should learn to live by. I mean, we're all tempted, but when he was tempted, he would avoid it. He would turn from it. He would resist. So he was a man of tremendous, tremendous character. And that's why this story is introduced to us that way. Now, uh, there, are, there are four points that take place. Again, the number one point is the initial character. God, when he has this conversation with Satan, he's going to point out the exact same thing. So in the first chapter, the integrity, the character of this man, this great man, Job, is highlighted and featured. Secondly... We see that uh, be, and even before the conversation that he had with God, we see his possessions were great. He had seven sons. He had two daughters, uh, three daughters, I'm sorry. And he had great substance of livestock and servants that served him. And he was very, very wealthy. He was very blessed of God. Number three, his sons and his daughter, it's highlighted here before even the conversation with Satan. It is Meant it is re uh, revealed to us something I believe is significant because, again, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is good for us. And so we see that his sons and daughters are highlighted as having feasts or parties and eating and drinking and, and even drinking wine. And then fourth, it says that after uh, their parties, every time, every, after every one of their parties, Job would offer burnt sacrifices. And let me read this here. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning. And he offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Th thus did Job continually. Now God puts that in the scripture for a reason. This gives us a, a, a hint of something where there was a flaw in the character, a failure here. You say, well, wait a minute, I thought he didn't sin. Well, remember what Jesus said in regards to praying? He said, when you pray, do not use vain repetition. Remember that? He, he doesn't want us just to do things continually, just vain repetitious uh, prayers. He wants us to have heartfelt prayers. And it's the same thing here with Job. Based upon uh, his fear or his, his uh, assumptions, they may have sinned. They may have cursed God. And so he was offering these sacrifices, you know, for them on the presumption. 
or the assumption that possibly they had sinned. Also in Psalm 50, if you look at Psalm 50, verse 7 and verse 8, the psalmist says, God said, I will not reprove you for your burnt offerings that you continually bring to me. Again, vain offerings, vain uh, repetitious things. This was not necessarily a sin, but again, he was not, his faith was in this was based upon his assumption that maybe they sinned. And that's not the best way to offer your sacrifices to God. Just go ahead and cover all the bases because, you know, continually just thinking it's going to work. And secondly, to, you know, some people say, well, wait a minute now. He was acting as a high priest in his family. He was sanctifying his sons and his daughters. Well, if that is the case, then how come it didn't work? How come, as we see, we'll see here, his sons and his daughters were wiped out and killed by a great wind, a tornado apparently? Well, if those sacrifices were working, you know, and they really protected them from their sin, why did they die? Why were they consumed in that great wind? No, I believe that this is something God wants us to see and identify as a part of his nature that wasn't perfect wasn't you know it wasn't necessarily a sin i don't want to say it's a sin but god says he doesn't like those burnt offerings being offered to him continuously because they're vain repetition and so we we need to take that up so these those four things take place before there's ever a conversation with god then it says here in verse 6 now there was a day when the sons of god came to present themselves before the lord and satan came also among them now very important for us to understand the sons of men is referring to the angelic host it wasn't talking about men because men are on earth and god's throne is in heaven these these uh sons of god that came before god's throne to speak to god were his ministering spirits who are sent to minister to those who are heirs of salvation they came and presented themselves before the lord they gave their report uh, that's very important for us to understand. Angels report to God. You and I have angels that watch over us, and they give a report to God. They stand before God, and we see here that Satan now has access as well. He comes among them. Now, how in the world does Satan have access to the throne? Well, again, this is not the teaching today. I, I did a, about a three-hour radio program on the subject, three-week radio program, uh, on the subject of why Satan has access to the throne. Again, if you write in to us or you call in, we'll send those things out to you. We'll get it out to you either through an email or a disk or, or a file somehow or other, and you can listen to it. It's a lot of information in the Bible that many Christians have overlooked of why Satan has access. And right now, and we're told that in, in Revelation chapter 12, one day there will be war in heaven. And Michael and his angels will fight against the devil and Satan, the great dragon, and and and. Uh, who continually, we're told, continually goes to the throne of God accusing the brethren day and night. And then that war in heaven will plunge Satan and all of his, his agents out of heaven and now he'll be restricted just to earth and when he realizes he's kicked out of heaven he'll have great vengeance and that of course will be the time of the great tribulation period of the horrible things that he will cause so many people evil people or influenced by evil to do terrible terrible things especially to the Christians and to the Jewish uh, nation. And so Satan has access to the throne, and then God speaks to him. And the Lord says unto Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered and said to the Lord, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? And again, now it repeats, a perfect person that's so sincere and upright, and one that fears me and eschews evil or turns from evil. And then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear you for nothing or for naught? Have you not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. And so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now, Satan now has permission. 
That's one of the questions that I, I don't quite understand. I don't think anybody understands. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord, but those things that are revealed belong unto us and to our children. Now, there are some things that are a secret in the mind of God, and he has not revealed them, and one day he will re reveal them. Apparently, we don't need to know. But he certainly has two things here. He has a divine ability to protect to build a hedge over us, is, and that's what he had been doing with Job, to protect him on every side. It's not because Job was just good, but he needed protection. Satan couldn't get to him because God had built that wonderful hedge of protection. But Job didn't have the mediator that we have today. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our mediator. Jesus right now is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for the saints. And the reason he makes those intercessions is because every flaw, every fault, every sin, every evil act that we do, Satan is there to accuse us or bring it to God's attention. And Jesus is there to tell the Father, put that on my account. I shed my blood. I gave my body. Bring health and healing. Job did not have the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not have what we have today. He was not yet a born again man, but he was still the greatest man in his generation. But again, this book here is, is meant to teach us that we can fall. And, and I, I feel so bad so often to see people that they're going through a trial or a test and, and they are deceived. They, they don't know how to pray. They don't know how to get back on their feet again. They don't know to count it all joy when, when they fall into trials or temptations. And as a result, they think, because of misrepresentations of this book, they think that they're a Job, someone that got, they're so holy and so blessed and such a great person that God is putting them through a test. But God's not really putting him through a test. I think basically God said, well, I, I guess you do have a right. I am protecting him. But if you're going to challenge me and say that he's going to curse me to my face, if I let you, know, let you touch all of his possessions, it's not going to happen. He won't curse me. God knew the integrity of Job. And so while one, one day, suddenly a day comes and suddenly four reports are presented to Job. The first one comes out here and it says... Um, um, there was a day when, when the sons of sons and daughters of, uh, of, of Job was eating and drinking wine and partying. And then on that day, four reports. First, there was a terrible group of terrorists that came in, stole all of his ox and killed all of his servants. And this one man said, I, I am the only one to survive. Secondly, another one comes in with a report. Fire from heaven came down, lightning apparently, and killed all of your sheep in the field. And ev all your servants were killed as well that were tending to them. And I'm the only one that survived to come and give you this report. Then third, there were a terrorist group that came against his cattle, uh, camels, and stole all of his cattle and killed his servants. And he said, I'm the only one that survived to report to you. And number four, um, it, it says that Job, or, or the fourth point was, then another reporter came in and said, um, uh, Job, your sons and your daughters have been killed by a great wind. And he lost everything. And then we're told at the end of chapter 1, Job says this, uh, Job rose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and he worshipped God. And he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then we're told, in verse 22, In all this Job sinned and did not charge God foolishly. And so his integrity is maintained after that first attack. But then there's a second attack that comes, and that is upon him. Satan again comes to the throne. God reminds him about Job. Have you considered Job now that you're going up and down to the earth and back and forth? And he goes, yeah, but, you know, if you let me touch his flesh, he'll curse you to the face. And again, God, you know, God yields to that. Uh, why, I don't understand. But he, he says, okay, you can have at him except save his life. Don't kill him. And suddenly... Job is struck with boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And uh, he's grievously suffering. And he's got a wife that says, why don't you curse God and die? And he looks at the, his, the wife and he says, oh, you speak as one of the foolish ones. Should we take all the blessings that God give us and, and not allow the Lord to take those things away from us? And so, again, he did not curse God. And I want to I read this. It says, and so he sat down. Well, actually... He said to his wife, but he said unto her, You speak as one of the foolish women. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? 
In all this did, did not Job sin with his lips. Now why is that put there? In all this he did not sin with his lips or with his words. You can sin with your mouth. You can say some terrible things. He did not curse God. He did not sin with his lips. But it, this indicates that he probably had sinned in some other way. Somewhere there was a fault, some kink in his armor. Because he did not sin with his lips, but the implication here is that he failed or missed the mark somewhere else. And so then it says in verse 11, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that came upon him, they came every one from his own place, and they sat. That they came there, and they had made an appointment to uh, come together and to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voices and wept. And they rent every one their man, his clothing, his garment, and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. And so they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights. And not one of them spoke a word unto him, for they saw his grief was very great. Now we'll see later on in the conversations that will take place that uh, God is going to be angry with those th three men because of some of the things that they do say. And Job called them miserable counselors or miserable comforters. What they had to say would, did not, you know, uh, liberate Job or did not encourage Job, did not pick him up. But what we do need to understand also, again, a detail that so many people have overlooked, that these three friends loved Job. They have, I mean, how many people will come? And when they see uh, him suffering, might even say, well, gee, let's not get too close. We might get, catch his disease. That stuff might be infectious. It might spread. But they loved this man. They came to see him. They came together. And when they got there, they didn't know what to say. Sometimes it's better to say nothing than to try to say something. I remember going to my brother-in-law one day and at a funeral of, of his son. And when I came to him, here I am a minister. I want to comfort. I want to encourage. I want to say wonderful words from the word of God to help and to strengthen. And all I could do is look at him and say, I don't have the words. I don't know what to say. I just don't know what to say. And we wept together. We cried together as we just didn't have all the answers. None of us have all the answers. And, and when you see someone in despair, when you see someone depressed and you love them, sometimes it's better not to even try to say something. But the other thing I want you to see here with these three friends is they sat down on the ground. They didn't go into the house and have refreshments. They didn't go in and sleep on a cot indoors somewhere or pitch a tent and, and camp out for seven days. They sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. And so while these three men we're going to see are also a lesson of how not to counsel somebody, not to discourage somebody with your words, here they, it does show that they loved him. And so after these terrible attacks and after these seven days of terrible despair, depression, and yet Job would not sin with his lips, would not curse God and die, just sat there on the ground in silence with three friends that didn't say anything to him, Suddenly in chapter 3 it says this, After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed his day. Now this is, you know, up to then, he had not sinned with his lips. But you can't sit here and take that reference. And in all this, Job did not charge God foolishly in the first chapter. And sit there and say that that meant everything else that Job said from this point on, right until the end, that he had, had not sinned. Because in chapter 3, he starts really sinning. He begins to murmur, complain, grumble, even blame God for those things. And we'll look at those references probably next week. I encourage you to tune in because it's important that you see this. He broke. He broke under it. He held his integrity. And God thought he was going to hold his integrity. But he suddenly lost it. And then after that, the next several chapters, we'll see the conversations of each one of those three friends saying something to Job, and instead of comforting him and encouraging him and building him up and strengthening him, as the Word of God tells us we're supposed to do, 
Their words began to wound him and hurt him and inflict even more suffering upon him. And he tried to defend himself and tried to maintain his own integrity. And it wasn't until a fourth man appears who was there a witness to all these things that happened. His name is Elihu in chapter 32 where he comes up and now he speaks words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and begins to set the tone for the change, for the victory to come and come back to Job. Yes, the last chapter of the book does tell us that Job overcame, but before he did, he had to repent. And in repenting and, and acknowledging his sin, he spoke right, God said. But it wasn't, uh, again, when God does speak to Job later on after Elihu makes his comments and addresses his points, then God speaks up and he really does scold Job. You know, he, he really lays into Job. He really asks him, where, where have you been? You, you higher than me? You smarter than me? You know all the answers? Are you greater than God, smarter than God? Can you search me out? Can you understand me? And God really lays into him and, and points out how great he is, God I'm talking about now, and that a mortal man, as great as Job was, is still a, a man. He's still mortal. Again, no one refers to Job in the Bible in regard to his faith. They'll talk about Abraham, how he was fully persuaded, and he, he, you know, he would not be removed. He, he, he you know, believed that God, he, so much is highlighted. But did you ever notice if you read Hebrews chapter 11, that great faith chapter, that Job is not in it? I mean, you'd think if, some people say Job was the greatest example and illustration of faith to us, and that's not the purpose of the book of Job. The purpose of God giving us the book of Job is to show us that even the greatest of men can flounder, can fall into despair, and become depressed, and can sin. They can fail. No man is without sin. No man is sinless except, again, as I mentioned, the Lord Jesus Christ. So keep that in mind. Keep that in your focus. And uh, we'll, we'll delve into this a little bit more next week. But we'll see that you know, and we'll see it in the scriptures. God put it there that Job began to multiply his words against God. He began not to curse God, but began to blame God, and that it was unjust. And he began to be, he became for a season self righteous. But then, when Elihu corrects him, and then God jumps in and corrects him, he says, "I have spoken once, I have spoken twice." but I will speak no more. I'll put my hand over my mouth. He now had realized he had been sinning with his lips. And so purpose of this, this um, lesson here and these teachings is to help you get free and not fall under the condemnation of those that would present Job to you in, a, uh, uh, you know, in an ungodly fashion. Let's learn from his lesson. This is an example to us of not, uh, what not to do it's, he falls into fear and unbelief for a season. Then once he's corrected, he repents, he acknowledges his sin, and then God blesses him and then tells those three miserable counselors to come and have Job pray for him. And when Job prays for them, then God turns his captivity and he blessed him with more than he had initially. Very important that we see these things, but in those chapters that so many people don't pay attention to, you know, they are there for our correction, for our instruction, for our, our lessons and doctrine, and, we, and to help counsel and minister to people. So you have a wonderful day. Um, I know it's a difficult subject, but I trust that you will get it. God bless.